Uh, hi, afternoon. Hope everyone's had a good first day and you're slightly more awake than I am. Um, all right, so on the 3rd of April uh, this year, I changed my iPhone's wallpaper. And this would be of absolutely no note to anyone except I also tweeted it, which again also isn't that novel an idea. I do tweet a little bit too much. Uh, except people also liked it. Um, like, they really liked it. Like, really, really liked it. People liked it so much that they asked for their own, uh, and then they asked for an app so that they could make their own. Uh, and despite having too many side projects at the same time, I thought it could be a good idea. Uh, and so Atlas was born. Today I'm going to tell you the story of this little app that I made in a week. Uh, it has taught me a lot about accelerated application development. It has shown me how co-designing with your customers, continuously publishing releases, and leveraging the tools available to you will allow you to go from idea to app store in mere days. But further, it'll allow you to go from idea to featured in just a week. Uh, hold up a sec. Who am I? Uh, I'm a software developer like most of you. I have a, a degree in marketing. Uh, I also used to compete in a lot of collegiate hackathons, and that's led me to a job working in prototyping. Uh, I'm also a serial side project maker, uh, often with a few too many balls in the air at the same time. Uh, all of this has led me to look for the perfect way to build solid, quick projects uh, while also maximizing their marketing potential. Much of this talk involves my tweets, uh, and if you follow me on Twitter, my deepest condolences. Uh, you may remember some of these tweets. Uh, if not, give it a try, because um, the story all starts with this tweet, where I tweeted out those screenshots. I said, I'm trying a new thing where I set my iPhone's wallpaper to the city I'm currently in with a blurred version for the home screen. Uh, I was followed by tweets like this, where someone was like, I'd use the hell out of this if it was actually a feature. Uh, or people being like, how did I, do you make that? I want one. And considering the people I interact with most online, people were like, why don't you just make an app for this? Uh, or why don't you make an app for this? And so I thought, hmm, I wonder how hard this could be. I mean, not entirely that hard, right? Just like get the map, blur it for the other one, save it out to the uh, photos, and you're good. Um, and so I built a spike uh, in an evening. And it was not entirely very usable, but it worked. And since the idea came from Twitter, uh, I naturally started tweeting my progress. Of course, starting with the logical quitting iTunes to update Xcode. Um, and then a few short hours later, I actually had something working, which just saved out the map and a blurred version. That was it. Uh, I'd thrown together a simple UI. It didn't do a ton that was fancy. Uh, but I tried something that I'd never done before. I tweeted this UI only after a night of working on it with no idea what I wanted it to do. And I asked for feedback. Um, this was my first pass at uh, uh, an experience. And I wasn't entirely sure how I wanted to work, but I knew what I wanted to produce. But overnight, I received uh, a really wide range of feedback from people. And I also received something uh, kind of awesome. I received a, a design from someone online, uh, someone who wanted to actually use this app and how they thought they would use it. They put together like a really high fidelity design and just tweeted it back at me. Um, I'd kind of unknowingly stumbled into this idea of participatory design, which is the approach to, uh, to design which is attempting to actively involve all stakeholders. You, the developer, your customers, your partners, really anyone involved at all in all of the design process, the inception, feedback all the way to the outcomes to help ensure that the result actually meets their needs, is actually usable, and empowers them to use your product. The original core premise is to give people affected by technology a voice in its design through participation. Uh, it's usually used in political aspects um, to give agency to, communicate, uh, to communities. It's often in social and, and civic innovation areas, but it can be used in all types of participatory engagement. So why should we use participatory design? Well, there's a few main reasons. Firstly, we should give users what they want. It, it kind of means just like don't be Twitter. Like actually provide what users want and they will want to use your product. 
The, the second reason is it reduces the risk of failure uh, and consequently cost, so we can be more confident in the product success. This approach uh, entails like constant reality checks. Does this idea really work? Do people really want to use it? Uh, when, when our understanding of the people's needs and interests is actually based on real findings from our actual customers, rather than our assumptions, we have a higher chance of ensuring a successful outcome for them. It also allows us to foster a stronger community bond. It means customers build ownership of the outcome. This is their outcome. A PD approach creates a space for a community to own the solution instead of prescribing solutions to these people. We facilitate it with them. When, uh, when people are able to give creative and, and critical impact, this translates into action and can better cultivate a responsibility and ownership towards that eventual product that we make. It also enables uh, uh, them to have a realistic expectation and, and lowers the resistance to change. Since they were participating in the dialogue that helped us design this, it doesn't feel so radical and different from what they're expecting when things do actually change. They can help understand that there are different and competing positions on a single issue, and so when it doesn't quite fit theirs, they can appreciate why that decision was made. And thirdly, it lets us strengthen communication channels, which is quite important because we'll rely on this later when we actually want to market our product. There are, however, some concerns. Feedback can be a detriment. One main concern of involving all of your stakeholders, especially in uh, the public scope, uh, can be scope creep and which direction you want to take it. It could be easy to allow customers to pollute your direction if you don't know what you want. Finding that balance between your vision and, what, and, the, and the wants of your customers can be quite hard, but from that balance comes quite great products. It can also be difficult to scale beyond the context in which the design took place. I mean, in the case of Atlas, I only have like a few uh, a thousand followers on Twitter, um, and only a handful of those actually participated in the design itself. However, many, many more people use Atlas. And I have to ask, do those people who participated accurately reflect the population of my users? Or am I chasing the wrong idea? But with all those in mind, we have to ask how do we implement this? Well, we need to encourage discourse and we need to get, gather a range of opinions and perspectives. We need to continuously ask for feedback through various forms to allow all members of the uh, community to participate. Um, it's easy to accidentally only allow vocal members to be heard. To, he to help with this, I recommend giving options. Um, have another option as well. Uh, so that your customers aren't constrained by the, the finite set that you give them. But open-ended uh, questions and debates, they are amazing and they're definitely needed, but they get significantly fewer responses and they often take longer to uh, gain responses. So I recommend using a balance of both. With all this in mind, we're on the path to true community-driven participatory design, but we need to actually get a result. The app our app in the hands of our customers, which brings us to, of course, continuous releases. Um, DevOps, we all you know, know different technical implementations of how to get there, but it is crucial to actually keeping our participants engaged in the development of our app. Traditionally, the App Store didn't allow for really any type of continuous release schedule. We kind of had to stick to this slow waterfall. You'd prep for... Uh, you would have your build ready a month before go live and then you would push it to the store and you would wait two weeks and then you'd get rejected and then you had two weeks up your sleeve just in case you're going to get rejected again. But today app store review times are so short that there's almost no need to worry about them. Uh, sometimes even the app store connect processing time is longer when someone at Apple forgets to kick the Mac mini running under their desk. So for Atlas I tried publishing uh, a new build every night for a week. Rather than wait and bunch up a new features, when I built one, I'd grab a low-hanging fruit, I'd discuss it with people on Twitter, and then I'd submit it for review. By the next morning each day, it was live on the App Store. In order to keep the community we're building engaged, we should release new builds rapidly and continuously. Customers get something new all of the time, and customers trust that you're actually working on the product, especially if implementing their feedback, like we mentioned in participatory design. 
Um, for Atlas, I, I, I tweeted, and then I'd build it, I'd push it, and all of this would be in one day. So there's a few uh, things to be mindful of, however. Uh, the App Store and Test Flight have some different timing issues, um, and then dealing with incremental updates. So if I starting, start finding something interesting, um, that pushing a new version to the App Store every like 18 to 24 hours uh, doesn't kind of work with traditional systems. The App Store is almost always faster than test flight at getting a new build out. And so you have to make this decision if you're going to wait for test flight feedback, which means it might take significantly longer than if you just publish it, or if you're just going to go straight for the App Store. In the case of Atlas, I chose to keep my rhythm and skip test flight and just continue to go straight to the App Store. Of course, then with the concerns of it didn't really have any user testing. So you have to make sure you have tests, have a rollback plan, and only really add one feature at a time. Which brings us to incremental releases. You need to be careful not to change too many pointless small things in each build. But on that note, you also need to make sure not to be Facebook and add a whole bunch of features and not tell anyone. Actually list what has changed, only change one thing. Um, and if it's appropriate, uh, you can credit an individual who helped you come up with this one feature that you added. You really only want to add that one thing at a time, and so that people can understand that thing that we designed together, that's in this build. The one we designed the next day was in the next build. Um, it's obviously not achievable in the long run to do this, say, every night, but the sentiment still stands. Don't, you don't need to batch all of your features together as to do one major release. You can just keep putting out releases with one small feature. And so for Atlas, all of this would not have been possible without the tools. And the tools that helped me build At Atlas was CloudKit. So Atlas needed a, a backend. There, there was no way I'm including content like in the app bundle, or worse yet, like hard coding it. Um, I did that once like seven years ago. It was a really bad idea. So Atlas uses CloudKit for two main functions. Um, there's the theme library that is populated by me, which is the slider up the right there, that allows you to choose the theme of the map <coughs> that you might then be generating. Um, and then there's the popular places, which is generated by customers, which is when you search for somewhere, um, the most popular ones are surfaced automatically for you. Both of these needed some sort of backend. Uh, and so CloudKit was to the rescue. CloudKit is Apple's dedicated backend service for your apps. It allows you to store user data and assets remotely, um, and it works similarly to Core Data's APIs, though significantly simpler usually in practice. Um, you kind of just take any Swift data, throw it at it, and it will just save it and take care of the rest. There are, however, um, some considerations about choosing when to use CloudKit. The first one is, do you run on Apple platforms only? It's kind of the biggest. Um, in the case of Atlas, yes. I only wanted to build just an iPhone app. Um, just because of the way interface works, it does support the iPad as well, but not really by design. Um, and so that solved all of those problems. Awesome. Having said that, if you do expand beyond iOS and macOS later, CloudKit does offer both a front-end framework and a server to, to server API, uh, CloudKit JS, which allows you to use all of CloudKit's functions on the web, um, and the server server API can alleviate a lot of the pressure. Um, however, it's not easy to migrate your data later, and you kind of need to decide if you're going to end up needing uh, like a full backend. Maybe you shouldn't use CloudKit. Uh, a second, a really awesome use case for CloudKit is authentication. Um, are, are you sick of like making login screens, password resets, collecting emails, dealing with passwords? CloudKit, everyone just comes pre-authenticated as long as they're signed into iCloud. And from experience, almost everyone is signed into iCloud. And that means you can skip all of that, and you can already start with a created uh, user. And so you can say to say goodbye login screens, you just go straight into the app. Um, Another cool thing that comes with this is for those users who aren't signed in, retrieving from a public database doesn't need to be logged in. So this list of popular places is retrieved from a public database. So it doesn't actually matter for that small percentage you aren't signed into iCloud, they can still see the popular places. However, the mechanism for deciding if a place is popular, which is like a, a right, needs to be authenticated. In Atlas, I just have everyone fail silently if that doesn't work, because it's not a huge deal if one person's search doesn't count. 
but uh, in your app, you may need to actually prompt the user to sign into iCloud. Um, do you have a risk aversion to third-party uh, code, or especially private third-party code? Like maybe you know, with GDPR compliance, you don't want to include the Facebook framework, things like that. The great thing about uh, CloudKit is it's, it's native. There is no third-party code. Um, the other thing is, do you have a risk aversion to third-party platforms? I mean, we all relied on Pass for a while, and, and then we didn't anymore. Um, CloudKit isn't really going anywhere. It's such an integral part of the system. Uh, and as a bonus, of course, less third-party code means your app bundle is significantly smaller. Another uh, question you have to ask is, do you only need a data store? Like, keep it simple. Just use CloudKit. Um, there's a lot that an iOS device can do these days. Atlas didn't need any off-device processing. Um, and so CloudKit just operates as the remote data store. And it's really, really good at that. And this is especially true if your competencies, like I imagine a lot of us, is in native mobile development. Like, you could just do a lot of the logic locally. Like, even if you have machine learning, you could just do Core ML locally. There's no reason to have to go off to some off-site machine learning. But the last two reasons to use CloudKit might just be its biggest. Firstly, depend on what Apple depends on. Your, your vast number of Apple's core services and apps rely on CloudKit's technology. I mean, of course, there's Notes, there's iCloud Photo Library, News, and that's not the icon for iCloud Drive, but I couldn't find it. Um, CloudKit is one of those frameworks that like, Apple dog-fooded even before releasing it. And we all know that those are always their best. So if they can depend on it for hundreds of millions of customers, I think we can too. And then the last reason is usually the one that wins people over. It's free. And by free, I mean like really, really free within limits. Um, to be honest, it is quite free. Um, the free tail uh, scales based on the number of users that you have. Um, you do need to be careful though. Uh, it is kind of scary when you're faced with the idea of CloudKit suddenly not being free. Which brings me to one of my concerns about CloudKit, um, which is to say I was a little lazy with caching at first in Atlas. Um, the, the list of popular places, which I've pointed out before, comes with a thumbnail image. Every time this view came on screen, I would query the list of popular places. And I don't just mean a page of the list, I mean the whole list and all of their attached thumbnails. Which means very quickly, uh, I was going to spiral straight out of the asset transfer limit. Um, this didn't come up in testing because I only had a handful of beta testers. And as I told you, I gave up on them after a few days. Um, and, I cl and CloudKit does have some basic HTTP caching built in. So I didn't really come across it in that instance uh, locally either. Um, but once the user count grew significantly, it became quite a problem. Um, this chart shows how I managed the, this was server latency as it was becoming a problem before they start charging you, um, right before my users spiked. So I did manage to just get out, but it kind of became a problem. It almost became a problem, uh, which is to say, like, cache the shit out of everything. Um, learn the difference between a query and a fetch. A query should only be shallow um, and just return exactly the only things that you need. Um, and then should be followed by a deeper fetch for the actual assets and the rest of the record. Um, this will prevent you from downloading half a megabyte image per query result. Um, and then <laughs> also, you don't use the default functions. Um, add everything to operations. This allows you to do things like limiting um, and gives you greater control over your query or fetch. Um, and most of your online tutorials totally neglect this. Thankfully, through the combination of the quick fix, the fast app store turnaround time, and some kind folks at Apple raising my transfer limit, um, I managed to avoid being charged. But it does raise that issue with CloudKit that Apple is kind of a hard beast to get in contact with. And so if you have these problems, you're kind of on your own. Of course, there is alternatives to Apple's. There's um, Firebase, which is Google's offering, which kind of offers a a full backend service. There's Realm, the database company that has their sync engine, which is uh, kind of just database sync. Tim's taking a photo. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's like build your own. You, you could do serverless or, or a full server or something. Um, but CloudKit made the most sense. It was the fastest. It was native. It got out of my way. Um, CloudKit also has a, a list of supported types. They're not e 
exhaustive for all of your use cases, unfortunately. Um, and so to make custom ones, you kind of, you need to use the data object would be my recommended way. So for Atlas, uh, I take all of my custom objects, serialize them uh, to JSON, store them as data in the uh, data fields. Um, if you have large data, you can also store them as assets, uh, which is typically used for images. Um, they do support any type of blob storage. You just need to keep in mind data is stored in the table. Assets are stored uh, separate to the table. Uh, one last cool thing about this is the, the core location, CL location object. It seems like it shouldn't really be there. It's, I think it was hacked in just for like some Apple product because it allows you to do this cool query where you can pass a location to CloudKit in your query and it will part and a radius and it will pass you all of your records that come back inside that radius. Like that's genuinely difficult to do with normal databases and yet they do it like for free. So if you're trying to build like an app that's heavily based around lo location proximity, like check out CloudKit's little hidden gems around location. It's, it's really cool. Um, you also need to be mindful of architectural decisions because there is no going back. Uh, at the DubDub Lab this year for CloudKit, I got a piece of wisdom from someone um, who writes the sync engine for Notes. They kind of made some architectural decisions a few years ago about the way they deal with attachments and images inserted in Notes, and suffice to say they kind of hate it now and are stuck with it forever. Um, when a CloudKit database is published into production, there is no going back. There is no migrations. Customers can, can continue to use that database forever. Um, there are a whole bunch of ways as well that CloudKit can fail, like the network be not being available, the servers being down the last three days, um, <laughs> uh, of course, trying to insert duplicate records and things like that. And they're not entirely unique to CloudKit itself. Um, but because of the way CloudKit works, it can kind of obfuscate these network errors away from you, which makes error handling a bit inelegant. So I recommend putting an error handling layer on top of CloudKit. Um, and if you want a really good place to start, check out Quinton's post, uh, Crunchy Bagel, has a really good way to test CloudKit errors, allowing you to, to actually get on top of them. Which of course brings us kind of a round trip. So with a solid grasp on CloudKit, um, and why that's a, a great way as a back end. Um, we've covered off the three main components that allowed me to build Atlas in a week and go from idea to featured on the App Store. And that was all thanks to participatory design and every feature I take back to the customers and ask them and get, gather not just their feedback, but their actual design input. Releasing those uh, builds as quickly as possible so that customers could actually see that design implemented almost instantaneously and leveraging the native tools available to us. Um, it isn't a prescriptive recipe for making a hit app, but there isn't really one unless you can predict the future. But this is a great way to build your next rapid product, um, whether it be a side project or your main gig. Thanks. Go out there and build something awesome. <laughs>